Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, hosting me uh, on the SEOS conference on AI and Humanities. My talk today will be about linguistic AI and its uh, consequences for the humanities and uh, text interpretation within public sphere. The rapid growth of linguistic AI, language models which map the probability with which words follow other words, brings about a cognitive and perceptional paradox. The new GPT-3 language model can write poetry, job applications, computer code. It is able to have a discussion about philosophy or a session with psychologists. It also allow, allows for uh, interaction with fictional versions of celebrities. As its abilities grow, linguistic AI and entities it produces become personified beyond the level of Siri or Alexa and enter an uncharted territory of artificial agents. The paradox lies in the double action of visibility and withdrawal. On one hand, these agents are not just dormant passive toys but are ready to engage in social discourse as semi-embodied intelligent actors. On the other hand, thanks to the ability in displaying human-like linguistic literacy, neural network language transformers can become invisible. Their textual output in social communication mistakenly taken as human or even worse, can cause disruption of economic and political consequences. As a result, a new type of AI knowledge gap arises, understood not as an access gap to AI technologies, but as a more universal gap between those who are capable of distinguishing AI linguistic presence and those who are not. Bridging this gap give gives humanities a set of new AI-related roles, from teaching AI literacy in the classroom to challenging the underlying assumptions, intentions and politics upon which AI systems are built. And this is, uh, in my opinion, something very important. Behind every artificially generated text is not only, uh, not only a, an eye, but a human with specific intentions and goals. So the classical communication model has not disappeared, but is more withdrawn, hidden, and more difficult to discern. My reflection positions itself uh, uh, between few research areas. They can be broadly identified as fake news detection, data mining, virtual characters study, and quantitative text analysis, or a classical literary hermeneutics. Understandingly, none of these areas deal specifically with AI. Both IT science and social science are still in the face of uh, finding most revealing approaches to AI from humanities perspective and to humanities from AI perspective. My proposed method as a literary and digital culture scholar is to treat the linguistic AI as an avatar and the text as a result of avatarian type of transfer. Understanding linguistic AI as a virtual representation of something or someone can help to identify the source of representation, its intentions, and if necessary, expose and dismantle power structures underlying the surface text. This strategy follows a logic of current developments in text generation technology which advance towards interfaces with a strong element of personification. Virtual assistants and conversational chatbots utilize the ELISA effect to humanize the computer part of human-computer interaction. Yet as opposed to current popular solutions, the newest GPT-3 a conversational simulacra seem to possess a form of intentionality uh, a will to be understood, are able to keep track of topics previously discussed and even to correct themselves within a single conversation. Uh, this is the effect of the enhanced memory of the uh, transformer which spans uh, at the moment to uh, a space, a window of 1000 words. These effects go beyond the ELISA effect to something more akin to the uh, hair effect, uh, as we might call it, uh, exemplified in Spike Jonze's sci-fi comedy Hair from 2012. The ELISA effect, rooted in the early AI experiments from 1960s, 
can be seen as a realization of an obedient servant paradigm. The hair effect features a much more realistic rendering of intentionality, empathy and emotion. Approaching these increasingly human-like behaviors as avatars can be a handy tool in grasping their artistic, social and psychological consequences. Recent studies demonstrate that AI-generated poetry and prose can be aesthetically pleasing and immersive on poetic, narrative and world-building level. Uh, there are occasions, however, when the AI-created suspension of disbelief uh, have to be lifted to reveal its non-human artificial origin. Identifying patterns and directions of avatar dynamics can serve as a valid contribution to such process of uh, AI text interpretation. The principle of avatar dynamics is a transfer of an essential attribute from one entity to another in which the source of the transfer is represented at the destination point. The representing entity becomes the avatar, an incorporation of selected attributes of the source, which can be of conceptual, mental or material nature. Thanks to this broad, universal framing, avatarism is able to connect cultural phenomena which occur in different historical periods, in different cultures and within different technological milieus. Historically speaking, the subject of avatar representation was of course divine entity descending into human realm, uh, for example incarnations of Shiva or Zeus or even Jesus. Today most common occurrence of avatarian transfer has its source in human agency, uh, as in computer games for example, where its target is a virtual representation of uh, this agency. Another use of avatar as a functional metaphor can be found in fields of evolutionary philosophy and genetic engineering. In this context, the object of avatarian transfer is the human gene, and the representing avatar an expression of that gene in an individual or uh, in a group representing the species. A longer version of this talk and the paper would have three introductory examples to demonstrate a development of linguistic AI viewed from the perspective of avatar dynamics. First one is the Virtual Confucius by Chok and Zhang from 2018, a conversational chatbot which draws from a carefully selected database of source material by Confucius and commentaries, and it engages, engages with conversations with users about family relations. The second one is a collection of poetry published this year in Slovakia under the name of Lisa Genard. The poems were generated using the GPT-2 and the AI was skillfully personified by a curating couple of artists and programmer. Because the AI's source material was a corpora of Slovak poetry and internet resources, and its output were poems about the humanity, nature and technology, the book was well received and uh, succeeded in engaging the reading public into a conversation about AI as an emerging form of literary authorship. Both examples demonstrate how the avatarization of AI can have a positive impact on public discourse by consolidating families, communities, strengthening group identities, identities and preserving cultural heritage. And it is not an accident that uh, uh, I chose AI works which come from non-English speaking countries because um, any ma manifestation of uh, emerging mainstream technology which came from a language other than the dominant English, uh, in my opinion, should be given a privileged space if we want to maintain the diversity of the global humanities. The third example is a GPT-3 rendering of the famous electronic bard challenge coming from a parodic sci-fi fiction Cyberiant by Polish author Stanisław Lem. In the story, published in 1972, a poetry machine is put to a test by an inquisitive engineer who wants to demonstrate that AI cannot create great poetry. In 2020, this challenge is replayed with a GPT-3 framework by Gwen Branwen. The test ends with uh, high scores for the AI 
uh, demonstrating enhanced proficiency of GPT-3 and, and at the same time a multiplication of simulated avatar-like agencies. Trained to recognize and imitate the literary style of any writer, GPT-3 was able to produce the, not only the requested poems, but also, as a direct result of its predictive nature, an alternative version of the story about the electronic bard, alternative version of its characters, and through the imitation of style, an alternative version of the author himself. His presence can be actually potentially uh, more visible, uh, for example, in a possible scenario when a fake cyber yacht is published in a book form and attributed to the original author Len. And uh, now uh, I want us to have a look at examples which are directly engaged in a play of identities afforded by the linguistic AI. Uh, the first one, quite different to cyber yacht and almost ghostly type of uh, avatarian presence, can be created by directly interrogating any historical or contemporary figure. In his test run of GTP, uh, GPT-3, uh, Henry Shelvin, AI researcher from Cambridge University, challenged the model with an interview with Terry Pratchett. Shelvin prompts the system with Wikipedia page of the late author and starts the conversation as impersonated death. What starts is a frantic conversation in which the AI Terry Pratchett displays shock, panic and a will to escape his ontological status of being dead. The GPT-3's predictive algorithms, at least in this case, fall short of delivering a coherent conversation. Pragmatic and communicative value of the results stand in contrast to virtual Confucius, the latter based on specific corpora of source texts in consultation with historians and archivists, comes out uh, of the comparison as a more purpose-driven, more informative and likable virtual companion. Uh, much more satisfying, from a sociolinguistic perspective, are GPT-3-based interviews with living people whose work and opinions are widely discussed and available on the internet. In the interview with neuroscientist and philosopher Sam Harris, who often engages in public debates with other intellectual celebrities, GPT-3 proves to outperform stationary NLP chatbots like Virtual Confucius. Informed and sensible replies are combined with emotional attitude towards interviewer and all-too-human-like perseverance in one's own opinions, even with displays of impatience projected onto the avatar. When asked about his late colleague Christopher Hitchens and any possible points of disagreement uh, these two philosophers might have had, the AI version of Harris responds. Well, he's dead, so I guess I can say this now. One thing I disagreed with him about is his relentless criticism of Mother Teresa for her faith. Look, I'm no fan of Mother Teresa or Catholic theology in general, but the woman was doing good deeds and not much of it was about proselytation. The interviewer then gives the AI another prompt in which Mother Teresa's least virtuous deeds like taking money from dictators are mentioned. She actively did bad deeds. What are you talking about? says the interviewer to provoke the AI. And the virtual philosopher replies, I'm saying that Hitchens was wrong about Mother Teresa. Look, I know you're an atheist and so am I, but it's important to make distinctions and show some nuance every once in a while. Mother Teresa was doing some good things for people, it doesn't matter that she was a fraud or a hypocrite in other ways. Then the AI concludes that his opinions are based on experience, as someone who spent time in convents and the nuns did more to him than his mother. Uh, this is a very interesting and uh, similar strategy of ending a difficult topic by the linguistic AI has been reported by other authors. One can start the discussion with a question, has the creativity code been cracked? Uh, a most general answer is no, especially if one bounds creativity with the notion of general knowledge of the world. In uh, 2019, AI commentators for The Economist sent a GPT-generated essay to a young journalist competition for the best essay on climate change. The AI text was read by six judges. None of them expressed any suspicion that the essay might not be human, 
but their verdict was clear. The essay was strongly worded, with a lot of context and question asking, but not incredibly original and without giving neither much evidence support nor original climate change solutions. It does not mean, however, that the textual output of GPT-3 is not creative. If we map the discussed examples onto three types of creativity recognized by the cognitivists Margaret A. Bowden, virtual Confucius fits into the first exploratory type. It explores the existing knowledge that database without breaking the rules that govern it. Lisa Gennard represents the combinatory type, which Bowden defines as a generation of unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. The third type of creativity, transformational, in which a conceptual space of the work and the author is altered to a point that uh, new structures of that space can be generated, is still rather elusive. The GPT-3 version of Lem's Cyberiat or the interview with Sam Harris are created with a conceptual space of Lem and Harris, yet without altering it in any substantial way. Are these AI avatars able to produce transformative amazement, bewilderment or incomprehension characteristic to this highest mode of creativity? Occasionally yes, but in general one must agree with current consensus that GPT-3 performs well at reshuffling existing ideas, yet not capable, it is not yet capable of creating genuinely new ideas. Putting aside creativity rating or AI's comprehension of the world outside, GPT-3 performs very well as a matrix for creation of linguistic avatars, confined to Ludwig Wittgenstein's world whose borders are the borders of one's own language. From this perspective, from the Wittgensteinian point of view, the linguistic representations of artificial agents based on real people with corpora of text ready to be processed by neural networks can be perceived as real, especially by the unsuspecting reader, regardless if the AI's contribution to a conversation is creatively misleading, fake or even point-blank harmful. Educational potential of linguistic AI is indisputable. Such historical figures as Plato, Kant, Queen Min or Princess Diana can be evoked with an AI prompt reply framework and linguistically brought to life to produce believable output within their respective conceptual spaces informed by relevant source text. A virtual presence of such linguistic avatars might far surpass the limited scope of previous language models and conversational chatbots. Philosophical avatars can be especially useful, reframing and rephrasing Platonic or Confucian argument with building blocks not only from the source text but also from common language of the internet can potentially reinvigorate classical thought in contemporary settings. A further research could be directed towards examining the effects these avatars have on its users' educational, psychological and emotional standing. Also, because linguistic AI operates within the Republic of Letters and the Internet resources, reflecting on representational disparity between those with or without significant level of textual presence might also be welcome. Yet the main task of humanities in the context of linguistic AI can be placed in spreading and rising the AI literacy. One of the tangible goals of this literacy is the ability to detect AI content on social media and other platforms of public discourse. Identifying and, if necessary, deconstructing not only the source of the message but also the underlying discursive intentions is one of the methodological phases of such a process. This way, a new linguistic type of AI knowledge gap between those who could detect the AI content and those who could not can be closed, to the benefit of public discourse and general flow of information within the global society. Thank you very much and I'm welcoming any questions.